Hey, hey, folks. We're looking at Edge Magazine, issue 18, released on March 1995, and as always, discussing the future of interactive entertainment. So on the cover, we have a very well-known logo, the Atari logo, featured in the movie Blade Runner. And can we get a sharp focus? Thank you. So, uh, these were crossroads for Atari. They had released their Jaguar console about a year ago, and it was underperforming. The Lynx was also pretty much dead by now. So, uh, they were going to release the Jaguar CD. I don't know how many games were released for that. And there was also talk about virtual reality still for the Jaguar. But it was obvious the PlayStation was a stronger console and had better marketing. So, um, yeah, it's the Jaguar seemed dead. And this is an interesting article about the company that started it all. All right, so the opening column is kind of odd. It's about the Las Vegas Consumer Electronics Show and how disappointing it was. So, um... Yeah, <laughs> there are rumors about the E3 coming in half a year, and that would become the new standard for conferences on video games. It's uh, the Jaguar, right? I can't tell <laughs> from this far. And the logo, still probably one of the best video game logos ever made. You recognize this logo too. And here we have... Gunpai Yokoi, he made the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy. That's why he's being featured. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. So yeah, the Winter CS is disappointing. Of course, the CS is also about other technological facets. Uh, let's see, anything interesting going on? 32X is being featured. And Ultra 64 cloaked in secrecy, so you uh, you could take a look at part of it, but you have to stay in the line. I'm not sure exactly what was revealed. Jaguar getting some attention. 3DO still getting some attention, even though that also seemed to be on the ropes. And... Uh, well, Virgin, back then a big producer of games. Well, not producer, the, uh, the uh, distributor. Distributor. Star Fox 2. Let's take a look at these images from close by. That will soon be released for the first time commercially on the mini Super Nintendo. But it was eventually not released. In, in the 90s because of fear that it would distract from the Ultra 64. Here's a rather obscure video game console, the Pippin, which would play Macintosh games. So I guess it's sort of like a 32X. And that it... Bandai would be making another console too. Uh, this is the BAX. I don't remember what kind of games were on it. Uh, but it was cheap at least. And did play CDs. And, uh, yeah, so the Pippin would use the PowerPC technology. And um, it was a flop, because Macintosh isn't that much into games, even with a dedicated gaming console. We have uh, what seems to be a preview of the DVD, the HDCD. And it talks about how it would have better quality, which would be close to that of Laserdisc, if not better and have a lot more space, so you could actually watch full movies on it. This is 1995. DVDs would become mainstream, I think, about 1999. Uh, Video Logic, another program to help you with 3D images. Uh, this is an odd commercial for the Saturn. I didn't get it, but it features the cone heads. So if you want to look at this really weird commercial for Saturn, can I please have a sharp image? 
My father always told me that the cone heads were important. Well, I don't know about that. But, uh, apparently some guy buys a whole bunch of Saturns. Really weird commercials in the mid-90s for video games. Okay. Um, Edge probably just looking for a reason to talk about the Saturn and PlayStation. I believe they did this last month already, but they didn't get around to taking pictures. They opened up the consoles, and they say that the Saturn is a mess. And, uh... I don't know what this is, but I think this goes on top of it. Whereas the PlayStation, is a, they consider very elegant. Well, I th both think they're very daunting, all these chips. But, um, yeah, the Saturn was known for being, having a lot, a lot of chips to do all kinds of different things. Whereas the PlayStation was, they knew what they were doing from the, from, from the start. Yeah, so um, the real interactive movie, which came was what was the name of this movie again? Uh, I think it's here somewhere. Uh, it features the actor played in Baywatch, one of the pretty boys. Oh yeah, Mr. Payback. This is a very silly movie. Uh, so the main character is a cyborg who exacts revenge on uh, what are assholes. In, in around Los Angeles, so every time the cyborg, who's just a you know good-looking person, comes across somebody who's annoying him, uh, you get to choose three different things. And in the audience, the one with the most votes, the choice with the most votes, would actually happen on the screen. So I remember seeing one clip where um, a uh, somebody had parked their car on handicap space, and the cyborg's like, "Nah, you can't do that." And the guy's like, and the, and the owner of the car is like, screw you. And then you get to choose what do you do. And uh, one of the options was actually dismantle the car piece by piece. So you would see that. But it's horribly acted, and there's no story at all. So, uh, but who knows? Might have been a thing in the long run. Let's see. We have a book called Hackers. Wasn't this turned into a documentary, documentary later? Uh, it's about the original hackers in the uh, in the seventies, especially who you know would hack telephones and stuff. So pretty cool read about the early days of hacking. Oh, uh, anything in the previews? No, I don't think so. Okay, letters. Will the PCFX get enough attention in Edge? Who knows? One writer says that the PC engine doesn't get enough attention. Well, there have to be good games for that then. Uh, one reader saying Jaguar should focus on retro games like Tempest 2000 instead of trying to beat the PlayStation. Well, that would be interesting. And another person saying Jaguar should focus on the sound capabilities of the Jaguar. I didn't know the sound chip of the Jaguar was that impressive, but uh, one reader thinks it, that it could go the way of the Amiga still being used for making music. One person being concerned about the amount of gore in our, our arcade games. Hard to believe people would still be doing that in 1995. But hey, uh, that's the 90s for you, right? So, entering the preview section, Looking Glass, one of my favorite developers. And uh, at their peak in the mid-90s, they had released System Shock and uh, Ultima Underworld. Now making a fantastically looking Flight Unlimited, which would play much nicer than other flight simulators. Instead of having all those difficult controls, you could just enjoy your machine, and the scenery. And another game uh, discussed is, I can never remember the, never remember the name. Uh, it's called Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri. Now, this game, I've never played it, 
but apparently it had very big levels and squad based shooting and voxels so there was nothing else like it at the time it wasn't released until 1996 and it didn't sell well unfortunately but people say that it was the spiritual eventually led to the game called Tribes which I'm myself I'm a big fan of one of my favorite shooting games. So maybe I should look into, should look into this. Looking Glass Studio would also go on to make the Thief games, which I also love. Descent, another 3D game. Now, I'm still not sure whether or not this game used true 3D uh, calculations. As you probably know, the, uh, Do the Doom engine and the Wolf 3D engine, they um, they kind of cheated you. It didn't really um, calculate all the 3D rendering uh, images. It would uh, do something else. And with Quake, they made a you know with Quake you could finally um, really move up and down and go onto higher levels and look around in all all ways. Uh, Descent lets you do that much uh, much earlier. As you can see, the levels were really 3D. and um, But the game looks like a Doom game. So I'm not sure uh, how they calculated the graphics. Nevertheless, this was a decent game. You could fly around. A lot of people just called it Doom, but, you know, being able to fly. Metal Jacket uh, for the PlayStation 1. I don't know this game. And looks like some kind of Mech Warrior game on the PlayStation 1. Maybe we'll get a review later. Sim Isle. Uh, I didn't, I've never heard about this one either, but I like the, the, the description. Apparently, um, you there are a lot of different ways to go through this, but one of the interesting uh, ways of... Uh, using the aisle, you are allowed to do your sim things, was trying to preserve nature, trying to keep it beautiful instead of turning it into a commercial mess with McDonald's and roads. Of course, that would be hard because that's the way capitalism works. It always sells to the lowest common denominator. And people like their vacation resorts, right? That's how you make money. And if you don't do it, somebody else is going to try to do that. So, a game with moral choices way before the likes of Black and White. Grand Chaser, a racing game for the Saturn. Kind of looks like Wipeout. But, let me look at that. Very Wipeout-like. But I had there was nothing there was nothing known about Wipeout at the time, so I guess they inspired they didn't get inspired by that game. Uh, I'd like to know if it's if it's any good. Hopefully, we'll come across it later. Okay, so here's an article on AM2 with their fantastic Virtual Fighter 2, which apparently used less polygons than the original, but because it used texture mapping. Um, you would get more detail. I guess they put all those extra polygons in the backgrounds because this level looks fantastic going under the bridges. And we are running out of time, but here's some here's some look at um, Sega Rally, another popular arcade racing game which looked fantastic, even better than Daytona, even though it used comparable hardware. So, and we're going to leave it at that. So next time we'll continue discussing Edge Magazine issue number 18.